right. Well, good afternoon again, Simon, and thank you very much for for agreeing to, to have a little chat with us. Um, by way of introductions, my name's Lachlan. Um, I am the deputy editor at our newspaper, The Martlet, and I've been doing it for about four and a half, five years now. Um, I, Rory and Sam, would you like to introduce yourselves very briefly? Hello, so I'm Rory, I'm the editor of The Martlet and we're from Abingdon School in Oxfordshire. I'm Sam and I'm also a deputy editor and I also work on the design of the newspaper. Okay, and well, I'm Simon Heffer and I'm, um, uh, well, I'm currently a newspaper columnist. Uh, I'm also a professor of history in my spare time, um, but I've been deputy editor of The Spectator and deputy editor of The Daily Telegraph during um, uh, an overlong career in Fleet Street. <laughs> Wonderful. And and I think you, you saw our, our, our list of questions that drafted. I um, did. So far away. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully they'll, they'll hit the nail on the head of, of what makes a great newspaper. Um, so we'll just rattle through them and see how we go. Sam, okay. do you want to start with the first question? Yeah, okay, so um, yeah, the first thing we were wondering about was, uh, did you ever work on any school publications when you were young? Yes, I did. Um, I was deputy editor of my school magazine um, when I was in sixth form for two years, and I contributed to it all the way through school. So uh, uh, it was always something that uh, attracted me and amused me, but I must stress, uh, that when I was at school, I had no intention of going into journalism. I thought I was going to be either a teacher or, or possibly a, a, a barrister. What was it that eventually swayed you in the direction of kind of journalism and publishing? Uh, well, uh, it was partly the fact that uh, I'd realised that I would have been about 40 before I'd made any money if I'd become a barrister, which I really would have liked to have done, but uh, I didn't want to start for 20 years before I made any money, and it seemed a very difficult profession to get into and to get established in. Uh, and I didn't go into teaching because I felt I wasn't ready. I always thought that at some stage in my career I would go into teaching, and indeed in my 50s I did. Uh, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to do so. Um, but I went into uh, newspapers for journalism, not least because um, when I was at university, again, I didn't do any journalism at university, but uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who told me she thought I wrote very well. And when I graduated, she said to me, you know, you're mad. You should try and get a job in a newspaper. Uh, so I set about trying to get a job in journalism and ended up getting a job um, as a sub editor on a magazine for medical laboratory technicians. Um, that, I mean, this is nearly 40 years ago, but uh, that's, how, uh, that's how I got into it. And one thing led to another, as it does in journalism. So looking back from where you are now, would you, uh, your career in journalism, would you have made any choices when you were about our age uh, any differently? Or were there any kind of activities that you would have liked to have done more as a, uh, if, if as, as one kind of 17 or 18 year old? The world was very different when I was your age in that journalism was not really a graduate profession. Most people who went into journalism, uh, not everybody, but most uh, had left school at 16 or 18 and had gone to train on local newspapers, which was a brilliant training. And uh, I rather wish actually I'd done that route, but. The year I graduated, which was 1982, uh, we were in a bit of an economic mess, rather as we are now, I suppose. And most of the big newspaper groups, the regional groups that used to hire uh, graduate trainees weren't hiring my year. So that's why I had to be quite imaginative and look around for places that, that were hiring. But even when I got to the Daily Telegraph, which took me about three years, I think I started work for the Telegraph in the autumn of 1985, um, it was a newspaper that you know, I would say was 90% non-graduate in its uh, employees. It had a brilliant editorial staff and uh, most of the people who were there were tremendous journalists. It was a very, very good newspaper. Uh, I hope it still is. Uh, and 
I was quite unusual having been to uh, to university and having been to Oxbridge. There were three or four others on the uh, journalistic strength who had a similar background, but uh, it wasn't a it wasn't in those days a profession or a trade that graduates tend to go into. Uh, and I mean, now if I were your age and wanted a career in journalism, I would know that. I had to have done school journalism, which clearly you have. I'd have to do undergraduate journalism. And I'd probably also have to go to uh, a university and do a, a, one of the journalism courses offered by places such as City, notably in the City of London. Uh, 15 years ago, I, I ran for five years the Telegraph's graduate trainee scheme. And we had there was such fierce competition for jobs. There were so many people applying. It was between one and 2,000 a year, I think, applied. Uh, they were all graduates. Most of them had good degrees. Most of them had been to really good universities. And choosing them was really, really difficult. And so you ended up with people who had shown a commitment to the trade by uh, going through all those hoops. They'd been school journalists. They'd been undergraduate journalists. They'd done their... Um, uh, MA in journalism, and many of them had gone and got jobs either as stringers uh, abroad or had been working on, you know, got, gone and found jobs on local newspapers. So um, I always felt rather guilty about uh, myself when I hired people like that because I knew I wouldn't have made the cut, um, you know, 30 years earlier. However, um, it was a very different world. 30 years earlier, and I'm sure that if, when I'd been at Cambridge, um, I'd been told that to get into journalism, uh, I would be up against an army of men and women who wanted to do it, and I would therefore have to prove my commitment to the, uh, to the trade. I'd have done things differently. I'd have got involved in undergraduate journalism. Um, I didn't get involved in it, not because I wasn't interested, but because there were other things I was more interested in and I wanted to get a good degree. Yeah, well, that um, sort of leads really well into the next question of uh, what advice would you give to young journalists today? Well, I remember being told about uh, 10 years ago by someone who was then my age now, so 10 years older than me, uh, that he wouldn't go into journalism now because he didn't think that because of the internet, that journalism as uh, we understood it would exist. And there were all these stories 10 years ago that newspapers would close down in large quantities. Well, no newspaper has closed down. Um, the Independent has gone from being a printed newspaper to being one that is online, but it still exists and still turns out a good product every day. So I think that uh, rumors of the death of the trade of newspaper are somewhat exaggerated. It doesn't pay quite as well in real terms as it used to. Uh, I remember being on a really fine salary when I joined the Telegraph at the age of 25. Um, in real terms, much higher than young people are paid today. But that is partly supply and demand um, because there are so many people who want the job and therefore the level at which they will be hired or the salary level is, dried, is, uh, is driven down. Uh, but also newspapers as businesses are not as successful as they were. Uh, and you know, newspapers such as my own now have hundreds of thousands of subscribers online. And it allows them to change their business model and to keep their heads above water. But it is difficult. Uh, there's much more competition, obviously, when you get online. You're not just competing with, with publications in this country. Um, you're competing with uh, English language newspapers all around the world and uh, other English language magazines. And what we have been slow to do, not specifically my newspaper, but all newspapers and all publications, we were specifically very slow to start charging for the content that we offered. And um, it's eventually we all realized we had to charge for it. And for a time, that meant the people who subscribed and who read it slumped because while there were still some people offering something for nothing, 
people would go to where they could get it for nothing. And eventually they realized what they were getting for nothing wasn't very really good. And they came back to newspapers like mine, where they got a very high quality product, they had to pay for it, but they got value for money. Um, I hope now that that transition is over, that it will be a safer career for a young person to get into, uh, that you won't wake up one day in your thirties if you were to join um, the trade when you leave university and find that you haven't got a job, indeed haven't got a newspaper to work for. Uh, as I say, I think reports of the death of newspapers were exaggerated. I think people do like to have a physical copy of a paper, as well as being the luxury of you know, sitting up in bed with an iPad and, and looking at it first thing in the morning. One thing I'm not sure of is how things will change because of the massive restructuring of our economy that's going to happen now because of the COVID um, uh, pandemic. And that restructuring is that many people who are working from home will now never work from anywhere else. Um, it was a structural change that because of technology it was always going to come. And it's come possibly more suddenly than we realized. Uh, because I used to see people when I was a commuter, um, I was working from home before COVID, but I used to see people when I was a commuter sitting on the train, reading newspapers on iPads and on their phones uh because it was a much more convenient way to do it than having a big a broadsheet newspaper where you didn't have the, the, the on a packed commuter train you didn't have the space or a tube train to spread out with your newspaper now that many people aren't commuting i wonder whether they will prefer the uh indulgence of a big printed newspaper to read at their breakfast table every day before they go to their desk and start doing whatever they're doing so society is changing all the time but I mean, the, the short answer to your question, I've rambled on a bit, but I wanted to cover all bases. The short answer to your question is, I think it's a terrific career, but it is really competitive. And there's a constant demand uh, for new ideas, new material, and higher and higher standards. And one thing about the internet, class, one or two notable aberrations. Um, it's always been pretty high class, whether at the red top end or at the broadsheet end. Uh, I think now the quality that we insist on in printed newspapers will continue to give printed newspapers and their websites an advantage over people who are doing startups. Some of these startups are really good, but a lot of them don't have the discipline or the experience uh, or the stand or sim quite simply the standards um, that established uh, outlets to have. It's not true of all of them, but it's true of enough of them to get parts of the, the spectrum a, a bad reputation. When you're starting on your career, was there any one area of journalism you were particularly inspired by? And would you say that's changed over time? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I was particularly interested in politics. I've always been a very political person right from when I was at school. And uh, I had a very clear political view. Uh, I went up to Cambridge in the year that Mrs Thatcher became Prime Minister. I thought then, and I still think now, she was an absolutely inspirational figure. Uh, I, having lived through the 1970s, when this country was what run largely by unelected trade unions and was down the drain at a rate of knots that it's hard to imagine today. Um, coming in after that and deciding to change everything, change the status quo, I thought was exciting and inspirational. And as I'm concerned, it worked. Um, indeed, as far as I think most of the political establishment were concerned, it worked, which is why Tony Blair had to turn the Labour Party into a, a mild version of the Tory party to, to get elected in 1997. Um, having covered politics, and I've been a political columnist, I've been a sketch writer, I've been a leader writer, and I now write political features. Um, having done all those things over a period of 35 years, a certain amount of cynicism and disillusion set in inevitably because you when I started out I was a young man and I was sitting in the gallery of the House of Commons and the people who were sitting down there who were MPs were on the conservative side they would often served in the war they'd won the military cross they'd run businesses they were people one could really respect 
On the other side, in the Labour Party, there were men who'd gone down a coal mine at the age of 13 or 14 and had worked underground for 20 or 30 years before becoming uh, MPs. And they had seen uh, life at the sharp end. And again, one really respected them for, for what they'd done. And um, now I see both sides of the House of Commons full of professional politicians who leave university, become special advisors, and then become MPs. Uh, many of them have no experience of the real world in any sense, whether it's as a coal miner or um, even working as a nurse or a doctor in a hospital or um, you know, running a business if they were you know, from the top side more capitalist inclined. And I find also, as it's a function of getting older, most MPs are younger than me now, they don't have my experience of the world. Uh, and I don't look down on them, I wouldn't look down on anybody, but they don't impress me uh, for the most part as they used to. Uh, I now write about a range of things. I write about politics still, but I write about the arts and culture. I have a cultural column in the Telegraph every Saturday, which gives me enormous pleasure. Uh, I've always been fascinated and interested in cricket, and I write a monthly cricket column for the Telegraph, which I also enjoy. And I write books um, in large quantities and <laughs> I review books in large quantities uh, for the Telegraph and for elsewhere. So my interest has moved really from straightforward politics to these other things. But occasionally I feel so motivated by a political question that I'm glad to have the chance to go off and write about it. In much a similar vein then, and perhaps as a final question to wrap up, looking to the future, do you think that Perhaps people have lost a degree of trust in journalism um, and in the way that the way that um, we kind of receive our information. And, and if so, what do you think, if anything, can be done to to fix this, this loss of trust? I don't know. There is a loss of trust, actually. There have been one or two horrors in my career, not that I've been personally responsible for, but in the time I've been in journalism, there have been horrors. You know, there was the phone tapping scandal uh, for which people were sent to prison, uh, which was pretty bad for the trade of journalism. Let's not pretend otherwise. Uh, and um, there's been you know, occasional, uh, there was an incident on the Daily Mirror some years ago of uh, insider trading by city journalists, and that was very bad. But generally, I think and I would say this, as I, as I say, about the tabloid end or the red top end of um, journalism as much as of the broadsheet end, I think that the people who work in journalism are honest generally, uh, have integrity and scruples generally. There's always one or two rotten apples in any barrel, whatever trade or profession you go into, and journalism won't be different from that. But most of the people who uh, edit newspapers are people of principle and integrity and they don't allow lies or distortions to be printed in their newspapers and you've only got to see how rare it is for Ipso to sanction a newspaper these days uh, and to to find it guilty of telling a blatant untruth to see that what I'm saying I think is reasonably accurate. Um, I think there's been a much greater loss of confidence in politicians, not just here, but around the world. And you only have to remember that one of Donald Trump's slogans for the last four years has been fake news. Um, to see the sort of person that goes around accusing the journalistic trade of being dishonest. Uh, I mean, for Donald Trump to call what I do dishonest, I take as a badge of honor, to be honest with you. Um, so I don't accept the presumption that uh, journalism is uh, suffering from a loss of trust. Uh, I think, generally speaking, people keep buying newspapers and keep looking at our websites because they do trust us. If they didn't, they wouldn't. And uh, I feel very proud of working in journalism. I feel very proud of my association with The Telegraph. I've worked for The Daily Mail, which is also a very great newspaper. And um, I feel that the people who work for papers like that are people who can hold their heads up and think they're doing actually a pretty useful job. Uh, because most of the rubbish uh, that is, ex well, not rubbish, but most of the bad things that governments do or the politicians do or the great corporations do ends up 
being out there in front of the public thanks to newspapers and thanks to journalistic outlets. You know, we expose these moments of, of bad behavior. Uh, I mean, my own newspaper famously uh, 12 years ago exposed the MPs expenses scandal, um, for which it got no thanks from MPs, but a great deal of thanks from the public. And you know, a lot of MPs were really taking the mickey out of the taxpayer and out of their constituents by uh, drawing huge sums in expenses, which they didn't need and they didn't deserve. And uh, I think it was a brilliant piece of work by my newspaper. And uh, I'm proud of it. And I think all journalists should be proud of the way that newspapers do hold politicians to account, whether over things that are almost criminal, such as that. Indeed, one or two MPs did go to prison for what they did in, uh, in those days. Uh, or are, shall we say, at least unethical and immoral. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's very insightful. It goes without saying. Um, Sam and Rory, are there any other comments or any last questions you'd like to make? I think it would just be nice to again share our thanks for doing this and for meeting with us. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me. Yeah, and same for me. Just thank you. That was really useful. Well, thank you. And good luck to you all if you go into our trade. It is, as I say, a great trade. You won't find it easy. But then actually nothing that's truly rewarding is easy. <laughs>